Well, welcome everyone. I'm Brian Stoddart and I'm on the State Committee of Western Australia. It's a great pleasure to have you all here with us. Uh, we've got well over 250 people, I think, so that's a terrific response. Um, let me begin first by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, wherever we stand. We recognise their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture, and we pay our respect to their elders past, present and future. And I think given this is an international flavour today, we should also recognise the First Nations people wherever we find them uh, around the world. Now, it is my very great pleasure to welcome Lynn Maxey as our guest from LA. It's nine o'clock Thursday evening in LA. Lynn, thank you so much for being here. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for having me. I've been so looking forward to this. Well, as you know, we've got a stack load of questions that have lined up. Um, everybody's just, it just created so much excitement and so much interest. And <laughs> What I'll say to everybody is we've got uh, a stack of questions here. Um, you've all seen Lynn's bio. We'll get straight into the questions, but I just want to say first, we had massive numbers of questions coming through. We've, we've built them into the way in which we've structured the whole thing. We've, we've got about an hour, but we're going to try and stretch it a little longer than that, maybe an hour 10, depending on how we go. Um, if we don't get to your question or you feel that we haven't answered it adequately. Look, our apologies in advance. We've just been trying to cram so much in. So Lynn, if you're ready, why don't we get started? Okay. Do this. Most screenwriters describe themselves as a screenwriter, but mm -hmm. you're a bit more specific about that. Can you explain why you do that and what the, the pluses and minuses of that are? Yeah, um, I love that question. Um, I decided a really long time ago, I realized that as I got into writing, even as a kid, I really loved everything related to sci-fi. It just drew me in at every turn. I loved, you know, kind of everything under the sci-fi umbrella. And so as I started pursuing screenwriting, it just made sense for me to you know, be open to lots of different opportunities, but to really focus in on, hey, this is what I love. This is the kind of story I'm good at. Like I can write a joke, but I, I'm not a comedy writer. So it made sense for me to just focus much more on the sci-fi, the spies, the speculative fiction of the world um, and go from there. And so, some people would think that might be a bit limiting, particularly when you're starting out. Did you find that? I mean, in some ways, yes. Um, but I think for a lot of people, the thing that I found was that it gave people a direction, like a, a box to put me in. And I not that it was particularly limiting, but it was a box that I wanted to be in. Um, it kind of gave people an idea rather than me just saying, oh, I want to write something, it was like, hey, I love sci-fi, spies, speculative fiction. So if you hear of opportunities or know people in those air arenas that I should meet, like, please send them my way. Um, and so far it has seemed to work out. I think it, it helps me tell my own story so people can then turn around and tell the story of who I am to whoever they're talking to. You'll have seen one of the questions we got from the audience, which was a, a lovely one. It was, you know, how does a young woman sci-fi writer get a foot in the door? I mean, how did you how did you do that? <laughs> um, I mean, it was partially uh, I was very lucky. I knew friends that were writing on a sci-fi show um, here in the states called Eureka, and they were looking for a showrunner's assistant at the time, and invited me to join. Um, and so I did. And so I worked my way up, but I was just already around. Um, people that were already writing the kinds of things that I, I love to write. So it, it fit very well. Um, but the thing that I noticed most particularly when I started going out for meetings is that I would dress like I was a sci-fi writer, whatever, you know, I used to, you know, show up in like 
a cute dress and my hair all curled and people were like, okay. And as soon as I started showing up in like black and like, hey, I'm a cool sci-fi writer, um, people were just like, oh yeah, you match what you're, what you write. Okay, great. You make sense. And on we went. <laughs> so you've got to be the sci-fi writer. So that's a good thing. I, I guess. <laughs> it's so I, weird. I wanted, to, I wanted to drop something else in here because I, I noticed somewhere you, you noted that uh, there weren't that many women in that sci-fi genre. So was that, and that raises the whole question about diversity that we know is so important now across the board. What's been your experience around that sci-fi world? Well, I mean, I've been, I've been very lucky to have worked with a lot of incredible women um, across the board um, in my career and incredible men too, incredible everyone. Uh, but there, you know, even in the last probably 10 years or so of the industry, I think with lots more like streaming opening up and just more people looking to get into TV, it created more opportunity and more of a chance for people with, you know, more diverse voices to join writing staff, to join um, rooms and let their voices be heard. You know, I'm, I know, you know, a long time ago, it might've been that I was the only girl in a sci-fi writer's room, but now I'm definitely not. Um, we're starting to see just, you know, a wider range of people and experiences and it's great. So that sounds a lot like you know, the, the standard response that comes back is that you've got to create the networks and create the, the, the connections and those sort of things and be around that world, I suppose. Yeah, I, it definitely helps. And, you know, it, it helps too to just have a, a group of people that are friends who understand the crazy, who, you know, understand when you're up at three in the morning writing something, you know, to have people who are like, oh, Solidarity, me too. Um, it it helps. There's a bit of a contradiction in some of that, isn't there? Because, in a sense, the writing is a it's a soul profession. It's a a lonely thing in some ways. But yet, on the other hand, to get the writing advance, you've got to be out there doing all these other things. Is there ever a a, a balance problem for you in that way? <laughs> um, it depends on when you ask me that question. <laughs> um, some days it's it's extremely hard for me to be, you know, by myself in my office again, four hours, you know, but that's part of what I loved about TV is that it kind of gave you that mix. It was now you're in a writer's room and you're collaborating and creating and having all of this interaction with people. And then it was like, okay, go write your script. Please don't come out of your office for two weeks. Like we'll send food in, <laughs> like see you. And so it felt like a nice balance. I do tend to be more introverted. So I don't mind uh, a lot of the alone time with my writing. Okay. And you said early that you, you very early on knew you want to be a writer. Now, when we do these things, there's always huge interest in how someone like you get to be doing the things you are. I mean, you obviously started early. Did you go and do a formal program? Uh, how did you get started in the industry? What was that trajectory? Yeah, um, I mean, I knew I wanted to be a writer in general when I was a kid, but it wasn't until I moved to LA with my husband that I really realized how much um, I wanted to pursue screenwriting. So my degree is in creative writing, but I, you know, was kind of pursuing being a novelist first. Um, and then it just kind of fit with the kind of stories that I wanted to tell that people were looking more for like, hey, have you ever thought about screenwriting? And I kept hearing that over and over and was like, hmm, I, yes, I have. I'd love to. Um, and I was able to just, you know, get to meet a lot of people and work my way up. So did you do did you do any uh, formal screenwriting courses or had you covered that in the creative writing program? Because you were in Colorado <laughs> or somewhere, weren't you? Yes, I was in Colorado. Um, so <laughs> this is an answer that uh, people tend to kind of look at me a little uh, crazy when I say this, but I've never taken a screenwriting course um, in my life, um, but it would have helped um, a great deal as I was learning because it's in some ways, yes, the, the things that I was learning in my creative writing courses um, at university totally translated. It's 
here's how to tell a good story. Here's a character arc. Here's how to decide, you know, figure out a setting. Like all of that totally translated, but figuring out how to write for the screen, I kind of had to just read a ton of scripts and um, mess up a lot, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of figure out my way through it um, just on my own. Well, you know, we had a, a question about you know, the, the relationship potentially between an education program in writing, like screenwriting, and the likelihood of success. I, what, do you have a reflection on that on the basis of your own experience? Ooh, that's a great question. I think a lot of people that I have gotten to work for did go to school for something somewhere in the creative industry it doesn't exactly have to be you know it's not we're not all like 99 percent screenwriting majors um here in LA but I think a lot of people pursued education that would kind of match with you know the business side or a film studies major or a writing major overall but then there are other people who come from totally different career backgrounds, you know, they were lawyers and doctors or business people and decided, you know, at whatever point in their life to move over into writing. And they're, you know, they just have, you know, the same chance of being successful because they bring a different life experience than someone who, you know, at 18 decided I'm going to be a screenwriter and did nothing else. Okay. So it would have helped in a way to get I suppose the standard format issue, isn't yeah. it? The mechanics <laughs> it's of it, basic. the architect. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And then build the storytelling in around like that. Okay, yeah. so you get to LA. How does it all happen? Ooh, so it so once I well, here, are you asking like my career? How did it all happen? Or yeah. how did you get a foot in the door? Okay, so that was a lot of um that was a lot of sending out my resume to a lot of, you know, hey, we're looking for an assistant. Hey, a friend of a friend is looking for someone. And the thing that I discovered is as much as I walked in saying, I want to write one day, that is where I'm headed. You know, I was a production office PA and I worked at a development company for two years and I did all of these different jobs in the industry, but it actually helped when I went to go be a writer since, you know, I'd been on the production side of things. I understood why you couldn't have 5,000 extras and 20 cars blowing up. You know, I was like, oh, okay. I have to think about that when I'm writing, um, you know, and working at the development company gave me a chance to read a ton of scripts and meet a lot of really brilliant writers um, and directors and producers just to learn from them. Um, and then, you know, by the time I decided, you know, okay, it's time, I want to really start pursuing writing. I just started telling people and said, hey, when you hear of an opening in a writer's room, let me know. And I was lucky enough that it happened about a year later. Now, through all of that, were you able to keep writing? Because obviously there was a lot of frenetic work hours and all of those <laughs> sort of things. I mean, were you writing at three o'clock in the morning or Sometimes, yes. Yeah, it's a lot of, uh, I mean, it depends on the show that you're on, of course, but a lot of times the, um, that frenetic pace of everything will go for six hours and then there'll be absolutely nothing to do for a couple of hours, you know, while you're waiting for a script to be written or you're, you know, everyone else is in the writer's room and you're an assistant just like manning the phone. So there was like a little bit of, a little bit of space, but yeah, it was a lot of writing on weekends and at three in the morning and, you know, early whenever I had a chance to. Well, given all of that background and all the people you met, we, there is, there's another great uh, audience question about how do you get noticed by someone like Bruna Papandreou, you know, the, the producer <laughs> for Gone Girl. I, um, I, think yeah. she's now from the, I think she's now from the Gold Coast running a series there, but I mean, yeah. how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you get noticed by someone like that? I mean, I think so much of it is write things that any produ any producer that you have in your mind's eye of like, this is someone I want to work for, 
writing things that would catch their attention is huge because a lot of times they're getting sent so much stuff and it's great. I mean, just because something gets passed on doesn't mean it isn't an awesome script. It just might not be right for that particular producer. So having something that would just resonate with, you know, whatever Bruna or whoever else is looking for, um, that's really the best way um, to catch their attention. Which means knowing your way around the system, doesn't it? And actually knowing what sort of products are being looked for and you know, who's actually looking for what and what yeah. sort of things they're after. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a whole other side too of, you know, people like Bruna, like she wasn't always this huge producer. Like at some point she was starting out as well. And so, yes, it's amazing if you have, you know, these huge producers that you want to work for, but you might also be a writer that's going to find the next big producer and you're going to team up and go create your like, you know, giant big name careers together. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's less about working with a specific producer that you kind of have in your mind's eye and more about finding who you click with, finding who loves your story, who's passionate about it just as much as you are and running together. That's, that's huge. I mean, a, a quick tangent here, and, and we'll talk about, you know, Ally and COVID a bit later, but at the moment, what impact do you think COVID's going to have on the actual writing of of things themselves, you know, given social distancing and masks and all the rest of it. I mean, is, what's the what's the discussion around that like? Oh man, oh, tons of discussion. Uh, my husband is an assistant director, so he's on set, so I hear all of that side of the discussion too. But I think, you know, for writers, I feel really lucky in that I was able to stay home and keep writing. Um, and I, a lot of the writers' rooms moved onto Zoom. All of my meetings have been on Zoom. Like when I came in the office tonight to sit down and you know be here, my puppy ran in with me, being like, "Oh, you're on a meeting." And I'm like, "Okay, no, you can't be on this meeting. Like, I love you, but you know, I spend so much of my life now um, on Zoom, being able to connect with you. I'm literally all over the world, which is it's really fun. But I think COVID. You know, I think it'll, there's always a desire for story. I don't think COVID is going to kill storytelling. It's not going to kill the industry. Like, yes, it's going to slow down for a while probably. And it's going to be complicated to shoot things. You know, a lot of shows right now don't have writers on set. They're like FaceTiming in, you know, we're sitting on Zoom, um, you know, covering the set now. But I think that there's, I think that, you know, in the middle of COVID, one of the things that everybody did, we all like we crashed Netflix because <laughs> everyone, at least I don't know if that happened everywhere, but here in the States, um, we proudly crashed Netflix because so many people were watching. It was just this hunger for that storytelling and that connection with other people. Um, so I think even though COVID has made, you know, this last what year plus 14 months really difficult I think in the long run like we're just going to keep going. One of the other unique things about you and storytelling is that you have this enormous passion for British things. Um, <laughs> I do it's true. How, how did that develop? <laughs> um, it was partially just I I traveled to the UK when I was 18 and had that total moment of like stepping off the plane for the first time and being like, I'm home. And I was like, okay, well, I'm an 18 year old American girl. So this is interesting. Um, but that passion for um, the UK, for London in particular, um, just never went away. And then the production company that I worked at um, here in LA was a British production company. So um, our principal, our lead for, the company was in London. So even being in LA, I was working on London time quite a lot. And it was the first kind of time that I was like, 
oh, I could write there too. <laughs> and that that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because you, you've got a great sort of passion for British storytelling, whether it's film or television or whatever it happens to be. What, what do you, what do you see as the major differences between, say, the American storytelling that you're in the middle of in LA and what you see in the UK? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think you know it's been interesting over the last several years seeing um, the British TV side of things move a little bit more to the writers' room model instead of the you know, a showrunner with uh, people coming into freelance episodes. So that has been interesting to watch. But I think in terms of storytelling, um, I mean, I think the American side is getting away from this a little bit, but it used to be that you would pitch a show and people were like, fantastic. We need 25 episodes a season. We need at least seven seasons. If you have 10 ready to pitch, that would be great. And you're just like, oh my gosh, like, no, I have a small, like I have a short story. And I think that they're, you know, that's one of the things that I fell in love with about British TV. Um, and honestly, TV from around the world is, hey, I need six episodes to tell this story and then I'm done. There will not be a hundred episodes, there will be six. And there's this um, economy of storytelling and just this like absolute like, we are going to make every single second of this count um, that I love. Um, and it's just, you know, England's fun. It's full of people from all over the world. You Lynn, so, do you think some of that switch too is the, as you say, accelerated by COVID, is the, the switch really from film to mm -hmm. SBOD and the whole structure around that and the fact that there's now so many high quality writers and actors and directors who are really on television now, switching yeah. to film, is that blurring the lines between say, the British tradition and American tradition for you? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, yeah, I think for, for good. Um, it's been really fun and interesting to see kind of this blurring you know even when I started out as a writer it was very much like this is a film this is a tv series and now when I'm taking pitches out there are times that I get into real discussion of hey do you see this as like six episodes of a limited series or is this a movie I'm like oh it can be either oh this is fun what like what version do we want to tell yeah this might put you on the spot a bit but who are the who are, the, who are the writers that you've traditionally really looked at as being great models for you? And who are some of the newer names you're thinking of? Yeah, oh my gosh, there are so many. I could, I could go on forever. Um, let's go with people that I'm more recently paying attention to and loving. Um, Emerald Fennell, who wrote Promising Young Woman. Um, I am in awe of her bravery and the way that she was able to structure promising young woman to tell the story. Like I, someone described it to me as a movie that reminded me of the sticking my finger in an electric socket when I was seven years old. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that is exactly how that movie felt. It was just, she was talking about such a deep, interesting, um, just like there was a deep passion in why she was telling the story and in how she told it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've now watched that movie a few times to, to learn from um, someone who's, I mean, understandably brilliant. Well, talking of brilliant, Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> how did that come about? What stage did you get on board? How did it all happen? Oh, um, it was kind of crazy. I was, I had known Bruce Miller, the showrunner, um, for quite a while before Handmaid's Tale. And so I remember the day that he told me, you know, he was going to be writing The Handmaid's Tale um, for Hulu. They were going to, you know, turn it into a series. And I just remember the blood draining from my face and being like, that's amazing. <laughs> Please hire me. <laughs> like, because I'd read the book in college and had just absolutely loved it. And I thought, you know, right at that time, I mean, that was, that 
that was at the end of 2015. And I just thought, you know, it feels like the time is ready, is ripe for a story like this. Um, and then um, Bruce invited me to join the writer's room in April of 2016 when we got started. So I was there from the very beginning. Um, and there's a lot of interest, as you'll have seen from the questions we've had about the structure of the writer's room on Handmaid's Tale. So how many writers were involved? How did it get organized? Yeah. Yeah, so there were, um, there were it well, it actually depends on the season, but generally there are nine of us um, in the writer's room, including our showrunner. Um, and we would, you know, start the, we'd start the season kind of, you know, looking at here are the character arcs that we want to tell. Here is the theme of the season. Here's, you know, some really important story points that we want to hit. Um, so we would have that kind of mapped out. I mean, you know, by the end of, the first few weeks in a writer's room, the walls kind of look a little beautiful mind and you've got, you know, index cards and a timeline over here and character stuff over here. And it looks a little crazy unless you've been sitting in the room writing all of it. Um, and then we would move on to each individual episode and break it as a room. Just here's the story we want to tell. Here's, here's the character moments that we want to tell. Here's what we want June to have been going through dealing with what is you know what is she thinking and we would just spend you know depending on the episode a couple of weeks um just really picking it apart doing tons of research um you know talking to people from human rights watch and refugee organizations and um you know the un just everyone and then once we got you know a pretty strong episode structure. Here's what all the scenes are. Here's the episode we want to tell. Then one writer would kind of take it um, and it would be, you know, their baby. They would go and then, you know, they're the ones writing the outlines, the episodes. Um, and then, you know, as they go off to do that, the rest of the writer's room moves on to the next episode and you just go until you get to the end of the season. What, what was the biggest challenge you found in that, apart from, I would think, on day one, walking into a room full of pretty talented writers and thinking, oh, what happens next? What was the biggest <laughs> challenge? Uh, yeah, I mean, so many, <laughs> so many challenges. I think we all, we loved the book individually so much that there, it felt like there was a, you know, a pretty strong God, I hope we don't screw this up. <laughs> um, because if we screw this up, no one will think, like, no one will look at Margaret Atwood and be like, ugh, they'll be like, ah, those writers, those other writers, like, it was all going to be on us. Um, but I think, you know, there was something about um, the book in particular that is brilliant. I mean, Margaret did it so beautifully where it's so internal. And it's so focused on only what Offred can see. Um, you know, I mean, literally sometimes she can't see beyond her bonnet, but there wasn't going to be a way to tell a story like that um, on television. People would be, there was more to the world that we wanted to dig into. So it was a, it was a definite challenge to expand the world and kind of follow our own curiosity into hey, what are other characters doing? What are they thinking? What is the wider world thinking of? You know, like my episode in season one was the episode where we follow her husband, Luke, as he tries to escape to Canada. And that was taken from a single line um, in the book where Offred wonders what might have possibly happened to her husband. And we realized, A, that's an entire episode right there. Um, but if we follow him to Canada, it would allow us to then tell stories there as well, see the wider world. So it was just, you know, still finding those, those new areas that we wanted to go visit, the colonies or, you know, any of these other places that kind of only get mentioned in the book um, without running too far from what made the book so special. You know, we don't, we wanted to tell The Handmaid's Tale, not someone else's tale. 
as you'll have seen from the, the questions we had circulated, there's a lot of interest in that, sort of the nitty gritty of that. So with your individual episodes, what was the, the interaction with, with Bruce on that? Yeah, and a lot of, lot of fascination there. How many rewrites did you have to do? <laughs> I mean, there's always tons of rewrites in television, sometimes for, you know, just simple reasons. Hey, we can, you know, we only have this many days to shoot the episode and your episode is boarding out two days over, you know, you, okay, well, we have to cut that down or, um, you know, hey, we don't have the money or, hey, you're, this episode will run two hours and we need it to not run two hours. Um, so there was, you know, I mean, Bruce was definitely involved in every step of breaking the story and, you know, reading the outlines and scripts and, you know, just helping us shape them. And, but it, you know, yeah, it's a, I feel like I'm wandering on this question a little bit, but like, <laughs> it's a very, um, it's a very intense process, but it always ends up with, um, your, our goal is to write an episode of television, not a great script. Um, that's a weird way to put it a great script that becomes an episode of television. Like our focus is on the episode of television. God, that's a terrible answer. Write a good script, everyone. Like if I can leave you with nothing else, write a good script. Let's just, uh, tease, let's just tease it out a little bit more. Yeah, um, yeah. So you, so you produce this episode and does the writer's room then workshop it or do you workshop it with Bruce or a combination of the above? Um, yeah, it, it's a combination of the above. I mean, I think, you know, especially at the beginning, it's, it is more of a full writer's room workshopping all of it. And then once it gets down to, here's the outline, like I am handing this outline in, um, or I am handing this script in, you know, then it becomes more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with either, you know, another one of the executive producer and writers on the show, um, who's kind of, shepherding this individual episode through or um you know sitting in Bruce's office um and just going through it and saying this works this doesn't work you know Bruce is genuinely one of the best writers I've ever seen so you know I would write a two-page scene and he'd be like great um you know you could make this just one line right I'd just do this and I'm like Yep, that's better. That's definitely better. <laughs> like, it's just, um, you know, it's a it's a learning process and a collaboration process. And the more you can learn and the more you can kind of step back a little bit and say, I don't kind of like set your own ego aside, the easier, <laughs> the easier it is. It's never fun to like hand in a script and be like, it's perfect. Otherwise I wouldn't hand it in and then have everybody be like, Okay, so on page one, and you're like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> for, for you, Lynn, what, what makes a great showrunner? You said Bruce is a great writer, but he's obviously got other <laughs> qualities. I mean, what makes a great showrunner for you? Uh, well, Bruce is a great showrunner too, I will say that. Um, the thing that I find like the greatest showrunners have is they invite everyone into the process as early as possible, sharing information and like just people who are willing to mentor writers that are coming up behind them, show them the ropes. Like, I mean, this is one of the things Bruce said, even when I was his assistant years and years and years ago, he said, hi, I'm training you to take over for me one day. I'm like, great. And, you know, it wasn't on a particular show or anything. It was just, hey, watch me, learn the ropes, like understand what this job entails. Because yes, yeah, so much of being a showrunner is the creative side, the writing side, but then it's also like, you're essentially running a small corporation <laughs> of, you know, a couple hundred people with tons of different experience levels and, different talents and kind of figuring out how to marshal all of those resources to make the best television series. Um, there's a lot of managerial stuff <laughs> and 
people skills that get involved. Um, yeah, I think all of that combined to make a make for a great showrunner. So if someone gets if someone get you know, like you, someone get picked up to get into this writer's room. Yeah. What's, what's the best things they can do first? Because obviously they've got the talent, but how do you build the, what's the best way to build the experience? What, what are the do's and don'ts? Oh, um, oh, let's see. I would say the best, the best thing I can tell you to do is ask your individual showrunner, what does success look like in this role? Um, because every showrunner is going to have a different, they're just going to have different things they're hoping for, different things they're expecting, different, you know, hey, you're, I hired you because you're really good at this. So like, please go help us with the character, um, shaping of the characters more, or hey, I hired you because you're really good at plot, like help us figure out the, the plotting mechanics of each episode. Um, but overall, I would also say just in general across the board, being a kind human um, goes a long way. And especially at the beginning in a writer's room, when you're just starting out, listen and like, inter you know, speak when you obviously have something to say, but no, like I had so many people tell me this, no one is looking at you, especially at the beginning of your career. And like, counting how many times you talked or, you know, it's just, you are there to solve whatever problem the showrunner is currently working on. That's your entire job. And if you can do that, you'll be golden. A couple of specific things back on Handmaid's Tale. We had a, a, one a great question, which I think is in the back of everybody's head is that you know, how, how daunting was it to be effectively rewriting Margaret Atwood? Um, let's see. The most like, oh, it was nothing. It was great. I'm a professional writer. That's one answer. The real answer was, dear God, it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> because you're just like, you're so brilliant. You, you know, you, you're Margaret Atwood. I don't want to screw this up. But she, you know, she came into the writer's room um, at the beginning of, I think that was the beginning of season two. Um, and you've never seen a group of writers more starstruck than when she walked in. But she was so kind and lovely and, and it was very open about, like I've already written my version of The Handmaid's Tale. Now you guys get to write yours. And that was very, that was very freeing. Well, it's quite liberating, isn't it? Because some writers get very possessive. I mean, you mm -hmm. hear writers who say, well, the film or the television series bore no relationship to anything I wrote. Yeah. The Atwood view is a lot more open, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, which we're very grateful for because I think, you know, the minute Margaret Atwood tweets, like, I don't really like the Handmaid's Tale TV series, like, that's it, we're all out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she was very, very lovely, very supportive. And, you know, it, it felt like a a really beautiful, special experience to be able to take words that she had written and incorporate them into what we were writing and to just get to use her like gorgeous turns of phrase, and, you know, very kind of nerdy writer things. Um, but it was, it was great. And it was, it was a challenge to figure out how to tell such a dark story in a relatively dark period in, you know, world history, but we really, we focused on the hope that she had put into the book and really, you know, despite everything, really tried to pull that out as much as we could. That's a good point to ask that the, the more broad question, isn't it, about as we look post-COVID, is there still a, is there still a an appetite for really dark stories or are we going to be looking for other things oh I mean I can only speak to my personal experience I don't I don't know what you know the wider world is going to be looking for but I think there is at least to me it feels like there's more of a hunger for things that are a little bit later it's a little bit more leaning back towards you know the 
true heroes instead of like the anti-heroes or, you know, just things that are a little bit lighter, a little bit um, just more full of relationships and connections versus, you know, everything is terrible and dark and sad. It's like, okay, well, we have the world for that. <laughs> like we, you know, I think there's a reason that like things like Ted Lasso just, you know, pretty much exploded here in the States because it's just, there's kindness at its core. And I think people are looking for that. Are you seeing any of that being discussed around the sort of circles you're in an ally and in, in writing and in, and in the story making? Is that sort of discussion going on? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think people are kind of, for better or worse, I feel like we're always writing in response to things that are happening around the world, things that we're thinking about. Um, and I think, you know, with COVID having been such a specific, terrible thing that the entire world had to deal with, I think there's, yeah, I think people are looking for more of, you know, the I just want to laugh. I just want to connect. And so like we as writers are obviously thinking, you know, hey, I, I want that too. I want to spend my days writing something that's a little bit lighter. Um, and, you know, I'd like to have another job at some point. So <laughs> just again, just back directly on Handmade. Yeah. As you went through the seasons, um, I mean, did you watch them when they came out? Oh, yes. Yes. And I mean, I had seen them, you know, a bunch of times by then, but, but yes. And when you saw the actors taking those storylines and those words, did that actually influence you or some of the other writers and the way in which the subsequent things were written? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think it, as our, I mean, we have such an insanely talented cast um, that the ways that they they took the words, the way that they brought them to life, we started, you know, we we would think about that as we were writing for them. We would, we would write to their strengths and write, um, you know, we realized very quickly that, you know, people like Lizzie Moss could tell an entire story on her face without having to say anything. So we, like, we could do that. We could get, we could get away with that as writers. Um, you know, it was fun to get to collaborate with our insanely talented cast. Mm, mm. That's, a, that's an interesting thing, isn't it, about the continuity of these shows. So were you conscious through the process about you know, getting to the point where it becomes really difficult for the stories to advance? Oh, I mean, I think you, people can definitely hit a point, like even if it's just like a tough day to figure out how to advance the story, sure. But I mean, there it usually ended up on the other side where we had too much story that we wanted to tell and we had to figure out how to cut it back so we could, you know, only tell this many episodes in this many minutes. When looking back over all of that, what what was the biggest buzz you got out of working with that project? Oh, man. Apart from Margaret Atwood turning up. Yeah, yes. Muting Margaret Atwood was a huge one. I mean, I think, you know, getting to, especially in the first season, we were writing in a very different political climate because um, we were writing before the 2016 election. Um, and, you know, when we started on the show, they hadn't even announced it yet. So we kind of were writing in this little bubble. And so I think one of the greatest moments for us, for me in particular, was just seeing it get out into the world and realizing that, you know, something that I had just sort of quietly been working on for, you know, the last year of my life was suddenly out in the world and I could talk about it and people could watch it. And it was, you know, really, it was affecting the conversations that were happening around the world. It felt very, um, I felt very honored to be <laughs> in a place like that. Um, and then, 
yeah, I mean, winning the Emmy <laughs> in season one was, that was a pretty great moment. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> that was pretty great. <laughs> and as a writer, going through that, what were the biggest lessons you think you learned out of the experience? Ooh, um, let's see. I think for me personally, I learned, I learned how to collaborate better with other people and to figure out how to support other people in their specific writing talents too, um, just to show up for people in a much better way. Um, I think for me on the page, I definitely learned how to tell uh, a story with many fewer words. Um, that was a weird way to put that, but um, you know, our, Handmaid's Tale scripts would sometimes only be 40 pages long instead of a normal, you know, 55 to 60 page hour long script because we just, the world of Gilead was silent or near silent. And so you would only be able to have snatches of conversation here and there. And so learning to write like that, learning to write in this very spare, um, just a very difficult, you know, difficult, different way of uh, telling a story than my usual, all the words, all the time, <laughs> you know, paragraphs of uh, characters talking. I had to get rid of that. Um, but yeah, it just, it, it made me excited about the possibilities that were coming in the future um, for collaborating and celebrating all these amazing other people around me who are doing really cool stuff. What, having gone through that and working on things like collaboration and what, when, if you were giving advice to aspiring or developing writers, mm -hmm. what would be the sort of advice you'd be passing on about if you end up in a writer's room, here are the things that you really need to think about and work on. Collaboration is obviously one. Yeah, um, collaboration and just kindness with other people because yes writing especially in a writer's room is so much fun but it is so exhausting and at some point you're going to be like oh my gosh I have spent you know every single day for the last 12 weeks with just you people okay you know it's it's a lot of um a lot of interpersonal time and so <laughs> being able to still connect with other people and find joy and humor and like come on guys that we can do this we can pull this off um that goes a really long way and then just write write your heart out like write the very best script that you can for the show that you're on um I think that's the that's the biggest part that's that's part of being a team player and getting the series as a whole one step further down the road. What about navigating, say, the different personalities in the room? And not only on Handmaid's Tale and other projects you've been on, is, is that a challenge? Um, it can be, for sure. I think it's, you know, you put any group of, you know, 12 to 15 people who are fairly opinionated and, um, good with words, it, it can be a little uh, complicated sometimes, but um, I think the best advice I can give with learning how to deal with difficult personalities is just again, like showing, showing kindness and like, I don't want to say having a thick skin and like, oh yeah, it's going to suck. You're going to hate it. Like but also just being able to kind of be like, you know what, I'm I'm going to return kind words for non-kind words. Um, that goes a really, it goes a really long way because um, everybody's had a bad day before. Um, but I think, you know, especially if you're looking at being, even as an assistant on, um, on shows, like just being good at your job, showing up even as an assistant and looking for ways to help others. Um, I think that goes a long way towards dealing with very difficult personalities 
Um, yeah. And then you moved it, then you started making complex. Tell us about that, because that's a very different direction, isn't it? <laughs> that's a it real sci-fi. It was a very different, um, a different experience. It was, uh, that actually came out of my, my love of being in England. Um, I very purposefully set the movie in London. Um, so it's the story of these two scientists who are stuck in a lockdown laboratory with um, what they think is a super virus that could get out and cause a pandemic in the world. Um, and they are in this lockdown laboratory trying to decide whether to save a terrorist's life. Um, and so it kind of, I was really interested in telling a story of self-sacrifice um, and what does it look like to give up everything for someone that you love? Because um, of course I gave the two scientists a backstory of, you know, maybe one day they had been in love, but we're not any longer. And kind of this idea of what would you say to, uh, what would you say to the person you've thought of every day for the last five years, if you only had a couple hours left to live, what would you say? So I started with those questions and just wrote an, an original, straightforward, linear feature, um, just thinking it was going to be, you know, oh, if I get really lucky, maybe I'll make it an indie film somewhere. Um, and then a company, I met with a couple different producers, um, Jade Alexander and um, John Jiwamu, who were, Jade is in um, London and John is in Cardiff, he's in Wales. Um, and then through John, uh, the company uh, Wales Interactive joined the project and they were the ones who said, hey, what would you think about making this um, a branching narrative, like choose your story um, movie? So my little 80 page spec script blew up to, I think, 190 pages. Um, it was very complicated. Um, but for me, it, I loved it. It gave me the chance to, instead of just telling one story, I got to tell eight different stories. Um, and then I get to see that kind of creative, what happens next to the viewer. <laughs> like, it's so much fun to get to talk to people who've, who've seen the complex and be like, tell me what happened in the movie that I wrote. <laughs> like, tell me the story. Um, it just, it was a totally different uh, storytelling experience for me and a chance to um, explore a new way, a new technology um, of being able to tell stories. We had a great, a, <laughs> a great audience question about how did you go about building those choices in? Because it's really a film slash game, isn't it? In some respect. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's... I basically just had to go back and it, you know, turned into literally hundreds of like two or three pages of script at a time, like each individual scene. Um, I just wrote it like I would write a normal scene, but then I would also then go back and say, okay, starting from the top again, let's say they had a different conversation starting from the top again. Let's say she didn't want to talk to him, so they don't have the conversation. Starting from the top again, and it was just getting to write all of these different, um, all of these different chances. And then, I mean, our brilliant director and crew had to then shoot all of those different scenes, all of those different options. Um, it was amazing to see, but then Wales Interactive came in and you know, built the game engine underneath it. So I didn't have to deal with any of the programming of it. I just, I just got to tell the story part and let them figure out how to do it. I mean, do you, do you see, uh, there's a lot of discussion about games and whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. do you see more of this work being built in the way that you've done it? Or what are the sort of challenges in it, apart from the obvious complexity? Yeah, that is, that is the challenge. I think, um, yeah, I think definitely there's, there's a lot more um, that's going to come. I think just from technology, um, 
catching up, being able to do this. You know, you might not have been able to do something like this 20 years ago that now with, you know, Netflix or any of the streamers or any of the gaming platforms, um, you can do it. So I think there will be more coming. Um, and it's kind of fun to think about what that could look like. Oh, it's interesting. I'm seeing some things pop up with, it looks like you'll have a few people, more people going to have a look at it pretty quickly. <laughs> we've, we've talked a little bit about LA and COVID and I'm yeah. just wondering sort of around the profession, you know, writing. What is it been tough for writers through this period in the way it has been, say, in Australia or elsewhere? I mean, what are the, the challenges that have been there for professional writers uh, navigating this terrible virus? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been, it's been hard for so many writers in the way that it's been hard for so many people across the world. You know, it's, hey, I don't leave my house anymore. Or, you know, a lot of writers are suddenly also being homeschool teachers because their kids are home doing classes over Zoom. And it's just a lot of the complications of life coming in. Um, and it can make it difficult to create when, you know, everything is difficult outside in the real world. Um, but I think, you know, there's one benefit that I have seen benefit feels like a weird word to use, but um, because everything is on Zoom, there's also been a lot of, um, a lot more openness, a lot more, just it's easier to connect. Like it used to be, even when I would go travel to London, like it was generally, I would set a bunch of meetings when I was in London or I'd talk to somebody and they'd be like, great, let us know when you're in London, we'll sit down. It was like, okay six months later, I'd have the meeting when I was in London. But now, because everybody is on Zoom, there's just more of an opportunity to say, oh, yeah, this is great. Like, we should totally meet. We'll have Zoom coffee. Um, and it, I think it's just allowed for a different kind of connection and a more immediate connection. Well, the association here is, and we, again, we've had a couple of questions about this. Uh, yeah because it's traditionally been, you have to be in LA. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think the Zoom option and the, and the digital connections have actually opened up the possibilities where it might be easier for Australian writers, Australian based writers to be uh, picked up in some way in LA or elsewhere in the States or around you know, in the UK? Do you oh, see some uh, of that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's so much easier. I mean, I have a project right now that I'm developing with an executive who is in New York. And yes, I traveled to New York. Like, it wouldn't have been quite as crazy, but we we're like, hey, let's, let's do this now. It's nothing for us to get on Zoom. So I do think that there's, there's a lot more opportunity. Um, it's easier. Everybody is used to Zoom meetings for better or worse. It's not like odd anymore or zoom pitches totally normal thing now um and i think it's coming at this time when people companies executives really are looking for stories that are from lots of different voices and perspectives and you know it's not just the uh la based writer who grew up here that they're looking for the stories you know if they're looking for stories around the world zoom makes it easy to meet and, those people around the world <laughs> and the inevitable related question of course is the role of the agent i mean if that happens i mean presumably you know, there's a question that we had of course do you still need an agent to get in uh and how do you get one but yeah. it, it, but it occurred to me that the agent might need some new skills as well as in a, in a wider set of networks or a wider set of in relationships or something. I was, have you got any reflections on that? Ooh. I mean, yes, I would say having an agent or a manager um, helps a ton. There are a lot of companies that are, they'll only accept scripts or submissions from agents or managers. So you couldn't just like cold call them and be like, hi, <laughs> please read my script. Um, they might not go for that. So I think it is, it's still really, 
um, it is still really helpful. And I think a lot of, um, there are a lot of, especially with managers and I'm like, this is definitely more LA based because this is here. This is my experience. Um, but, you know, talking to people, letting people know that you're looking for an agent or manager. Um, I mean, I've even seen recently on social media, like people just not posting at, like not tweeting at direct agents or tweeting at managers, but just saying like, hey, I'm a writer. This is the kind of stuff I write. I'm looking for a manager or I'm looking for an agent. Like, why not? Like everybody is kind of taking chances right now. Um, and, you know, keeping an eye on, um, especially with managers, a lot of times we'll have like, hey, you can submit here or, you know, I'm happy to read the first 10 pages of your script. Like if you look for it, you can find opportunities like that and finding, um, finding someone that you think would be a good fit with you and just going for it and then being patient. I wish, uh, I wish I had better, <laughs> better answers there. I think they're, they're tough questions in a way. Uh, we're <laughs> sort of getting to the end of this. Um, so yeah. in, no, these, in these exciting times, what, what's next for you? And what can you tell us that you're working on? And, and what would you like to see other people writing on? Oh, ooh, I would so much rather answer the second question. So I have a few... Um, I have a few projects that are um, in process. I'm writing a script for Amazon right now. Um, so that is that's getting further down the road. Hopefully that will um, be moving forward soon. And then I'm just developing several different projects right now. Um, I'm writing a feature and I'm going to go pitch a different feature here in a few weeks. So it's just lots of irons in the fire. Um, and hopefully they will all come out <laughs> they will all happen that would be amazing um but what I would so much rather ooh, what do I want to see people working on I think I mean as a sci-fi writer I would I love I love all sci-fi so like any sci-fi yes I'm in I will watch um but I think there's something we're at just such a specific point in history in world history in creative history where um there's just this need for hope and connection and so any kind of story that is is about that hope and connection um I like I would love to see that or stories that I can just tell how much the person writing it just had the time of their life writing it those are the movies I want to see like those are the tv series that I'm like I'm in, I don't even, I, yeah, I'm, yep, done, solid, I'm in. <laughs> then that's a good point to finish, I think. So look, can I thank everybody very much for, for linking in here. We, uh, there will be a, a video replay of this available. I know we've got a whole bunch of other people lined up to look at that. Uh, but can I thank uh, Shannon Usher and Rachel Healy for keeping us online and setting it all up. That's been terrific. But Lynn, thanks so much for your time. I'm, uh, every, I'm sure everybody's learned a lot and had a lot of fun on the way through. Oh, um, so. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. I really appreciate there's, it. There's been so much else to talk about. We might have to do it again some other time. But look, thank you, you know, very much <laughs> from the Australian Writers Guild. We really appreciate your time. Um, thanks to everybody else and hope to see you again sometime. Thanks, Thanks everybody.